odd little combination here. This is a, a, a Dobro style resonator uh, in a guitar which was made for me by the lovely Roger Bucknell at Filed Guitars. And uh, I'm running it through that little thing back there, which is, well, it's not a little thing, it's a pretty big thing. It's a 58 Magnetone, which uh, I found entirely by accident. Um, and I love it to bits. And it's so musical, that vibrato unit on it. So I use that on the new record, um, but playing my little Gibson with its uh, de-arm and sound hole pickup. But the other day I was teaching somebody and started to play around with this guitar through it. And it's just something so gratifying. that sound. And that's what I look for constantly. I'm looking for something that leads me. So what I'm doing here, I'm playing in a G tuning. It's G with a suspended fourth and fourth in the bass. So C, G, D, G, C, D. That's C, G, D, G, C, D. I, I'm known for playing modern guitars. I'm known for playing Sobels and uh, PRSs and, you know, the work of modern individual luthiers. So I was more surprised than anybody to find this guitar, which is a, it's a classic Martin. It's a 1931 0018. And I, I picked it up because I wanted to know. I'd been told by friends of mine in the States that this would be a perfect guitar for me. <laughs> I'd never even seen one. Um, TJ Thompson, who is, I think, the kind of king of Martin restorations, said, you should have a, one of these guitars. So I picked this thing up and... Uh, they were right. It's astonishing. So it's tuned in dadgad and uh, it's a very challenging guitar it's like some of the best guitars I think um, people think that a guitar should be easy to play I don't think that's necessarily the case this guitar is totally unforgiving if you make a mistake it's, it's kind of like so bells if you make a mistake it amplifies it and a little flag comes up going Ooh. <laughs> I think an incredibly modern sounding guitar, despite the fact that it is actually a classic vintage instrument. This is um, one of my PRS signature guitars. This one is made of Honduras rosewood. It has a a Pernambuco neck, which is what they make violin bows out of, which is just a little amazing, very dense hardwood with hardly any, you know, sort of grain pattern in it at all. And this guitar I tend to keep in with light gauge strings on it, which is very unlike me, but it just loves it. I'm tuned in a C suspended second tuning, so C, G, C, G, C, D, but tuned up to, I mean, uh, capoed up to the fifth fret. So I'm playing in the key of F. I play a tune which is on the new record. It's called The Plains of Waterloo. And it's, it's a, a tune, it's an unaccompanied tune originally. It was recorded, uh, collected from a, a guy in Ottawa in Canada. And, uh, 
It's fascinating to me because it starts completely major. So that's the opening phrase of the thing. And I'm very much, I'm playing it as much as possible on alternate strings, consecutive strings. So it's kind of harpish. But then the next phrase, the mode changes and it comes, brings in this flat seven. And then goes back. Goes to the five chord and then again, same line. third line of the tune goes into the minor. So I love that tune, I think that's an astonishing melody. When the folk song collectors actually went out and found, found these tunes, they came back with them to academics and classical musicians and said, look, just collected this. And on several occasions, the academics and the, the classical guys said, oh, you've, got to make, you've made a mistake here because there's no way that a peasant could uh, understand a piece of music like that. So you must have got it down wrong. <laughs> I, I love that, I think it's good. So this is um, the guitar that I use most on gigs. It's a, a PRS um, signature model. And this one's a, a prototype. It's very experimental in that it's basically got the thinnest finish that you could possibly put on a guitar. It's almost no finish at all. Um, it's a Adirondack top and uh, again, Honduras rosewood back and sides. And this guitar has uh, has done a lot of gigs. So the whole relationship with, with PRS um, took me by surprise, as things often do in this life. Um, the phone rang one day and it was Paul Smith saying, uh, I'm gonna develop a line of acoustics and uh, I have a short list of people I'd like to help out. Um, Ricky Skaggs and Tony McManus um, and Cody Kilby and yourself. And I went, oh, well, that's very nice. And he said, you know, there's no, there's no pressure here. I just think you'd be a good person to help out with the design of these things. So they sent me a prototype, which I responded by saying, I think it's a brilliant guitar, but it feels like an electric guitar player's guitar. You know, it's the next too narrow for me and string spacing is not, it's not big, you know. So they made another one, which was superb instrument but again it just needed a bit more heft to it and the third one arrived and I literally had got it out of the case and the phone rang and a voice said you're happy right and I was happy it was great so then we went on and we made these signature guitars and they are they do have a big neck but in my experience big necks actually make for really good tone <laughs> So this guitar is in production now and there's a, a sort of a private stock and then uh, an even more fancy version of it.
So this, uh, I'm playing slide, obviously, and this thing is, uh, <laughs> it's, it's all signature here, folks, all signature. This is a Wolfram uh, slide, um, Martin Simpson signature model. It's made of tungsten carbide. It weighs more than the guitar. It's actually astonishingly heavy, but it's astonishingly great tonally because it's, the surface of it is basically incorruptible. This has been, I've used this for I think three years now. So it's been knocking about in a neck box of a case with, you know, string cutters and, and capos and all sorts of things. And it, it's perfect, it's a perfect finish. So it's a really, really great tool. Um, the tuning that I was playing in there is one of my favorites. It's C, G, C, F. C, D. And the way I look at all these tunings is the same. Basically, it's got a root, fifth root. So there's a power chord there. And then that's a suspended fourth. So this much of the tuning is the same as dadgad or the same as dropped D tuning. But then the second string is another C. So you've got root, fifth, root, fourth, root, and then ninth. So it's C sus four, add nine. And it's a great tuning for playing almost any kind of music as far as, as far as I've discovered. You can play jazzy stuff and bluesy stuff and very melodic. So whereas in, if you were playing in dadgad, you would always be hearing that, the top string being a root. Here you have a lack of resolution almost all the time, and it's really excellent kind of pregnant feel to it. a little um, jug band tune called Stealing, which we recorded on the latest record on the trio record.
So that's what we call claw hammer banjo, which is uh, it's all played with the backs. So all the movements are, are down movements. There's no up picking at all. So the lead notes played with the back of the index finger. And then you've got the second finger kind of sitting there making some brush strokes. The left, left hand's pulling off to give you a, another beat of the one and two, and so it's going one and two. And the thumbs to start with, just doing that. When you start to play melodic figures, then the thumb starts to cross over. So it's called drop thumb frailing as well. Tuning is is a G sus four tuning, so it's like the tuning that I was playing the uh, the dobro in to start with. So that's root fifth root fourth fifth. So it functions in exactly the same way as the guitar tunings do, but of course instead of having a low bass, it's got a high octave. The banjo here was made by Jason and Faris Romero, who are, they're a couple from uh, Horsefly, British Columbia, which is, it's so out in the, in the outback of British Columbia in Canada, it's the kind of place you have to get a new dog every few months because bears eat them, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit wild out there. Um, this was my 60th birthday present to myself. It's a custom built instrument. Faris uh, has a degree in botany, so her inlays are, absolutely perfect and this is a slow blossom inlay on the neck. The whole aesthetic of the instrument I think is astonishing. It, it, it is one of the finest instruments of any kind that I've ever come across and I count myself very lucky to, to have it. Every time I pick it up it blows my head off which is what we're looking for in an instrument which is why I have more than one you know they, they're here to constantly inspire. So. It's a lovely thing and it has in it a prototype pickup. Banjos are notoriously hard to amplify except with a microphone. This is a, a, a pickup made by Rick Turner who was one of the founders of Alembic and uh, Highlander pickups and Detar. Uh, an amazing builder. He ma I mean he made um, Lindsey Buckingham's guitars for instance. But he and his son Eli have come up with this system for amplifying the banjo and I think it's probably magic to be honest so it's a lovely thing. When I first started to play I was 12 years old I was playing in folk clubs no PA system and so the idea was you made as much noise as you possibly could and so finger picks were the thing so I got um, two national finger picks and here comes the cat I love that cat will come into the shot. We'll ignore the cat and carry on, shall we? Or do you want the cat to go out? <laughs> right, good. There's the cat. Um, so, two national finger picks, steel finger picks, and a Dobro thumb pick, which is a clear celluloid thumb pick at the time. Um, I used those, and I used those on the banjo as well. When I first got the banjo when I was 13, and I tried to play bluegrass banjo, and then realised that actually... You can't play bluegrass banjo on your own. You need, you need a backbeat to play against. It's just a pointless exercise. Meanwhile, I discovered claw hammer banjo, which I demonstrated earlier. You can't play that with picks, it's, you know, really. So I started to play with a thumb pick and my nails. But what had happened, I'd already developed this technique whereby my thumb, because of using the pick, stayed parallel to the strings like that. So my hand position really is the same to this day. Flat wrist, a finger per string, and the thumb in the bass. That's my at rest position. So 
If I play a basic right hand picking technique, this is the kind of thing you absolutely have to be able to do. You have to isolate your fingers. So thumb plays a bass string, index finger plays the third string, thumb plays the fourth string, second finger plays the second string. You get this. One and two and one and two and one and two and one and two. And have to be able to do that. That's absolutely essential because what it teaches you is digital independence. Now I use three fingers and as you can see quite considerable nails. Um, I actually go and have my nails silk wrapped which is what it sounds like. You have a sheet of silk wrapped over your nail, shot with super glue and then hit with an accelerator. So it very rapidly becomes the equivalent of fiberglass but it is actually silk the material that they use. And what that does is it gives me this real strong clarity. And over the years, because I've reinforced my nails so much, I've ended up using my index finger quite a lot of the time as a source of attack. So it might look like I'm using my thumb pick, but I'm actually... using my index finger as a flat pick effect. Now it's not, it's not super loud. So the interesting thing is you can use this index finger and it's very warm and very different from the sound of the, the attack with the nails going the other way. If you, this is the kind of thing I pay attention to. If you listen to the attack coming that way with the fingernail and compare it to that, there's a lot more bottom end and weight. In the fingernail going down, because it's actually backed by the, by the meat of your finger, if you like. So over the years, I've I've thrown in as many different ways of attacking as I can from the right hand. So I have, for instance, in addition to that kind of, you know, just normal rocking the bass and introducing fingers, I've got lots of other attacks. If you listen to old time country players, a lot of the time there's this going on. So that's happening there, thumb, one, brush, up, Carter family. I think that's another essential ingredient, being able to isolate index, sorry, thumb, index, and brush stroke. But then what you can do is you can bring that all into a very tight space so you get thumb, index, sorry, thumb, index, and then instead of a brush stroke, you get an attack, a flick. That kind of sound, which is, it's a bit like slapping bass, it's also a bit like playing the banjo. Just like you're throwing everything short of the kitchen sink at it basically but it gives you a huge amount of different tone colors <laughs> 